All right, uh, this is the unit on sexuality and gender, sex and gender. Uh, I, uh, gosh, um, when I first started my career as a sociologist, I was a feminist sociologist, and much of my research was on the gender division of labor between women and men and how women and men were sharing their obligations, their paid employment and their housework and their child rearing. Uh, and I also uh, am a feminist theorist, so I spend a lot of time reading feminist theories. So I think this topic is really interesting. Uh, I have two lectures for you. One is going to be about kind of the history of feminist movements uh, in the United States in particular. And then the next one is going to be about kind of theoretical perspectives and what research is showing us about uh, women generally. This is just because it's an introductory sociology course. I actually believe that, oh my gosh, we could take a semester or more just on this topic. And so I won't be talking to you that much about masculinity studies or what research is showing about gender or in terms of men. And so mainly this is going to be about uh, kind of feminist or theoretical perspectives on women uh, and maybe uh, a diversity around sexual orientation. But it's not necessarily about masculinity studies, which is also a rich area of study, a rich field of study. Okay, so basically two important definitions you need to know, and you probably already know them as college students, is the difference between sex versus gender. And so when a sociologist uses the word sex, they're talking about the biological differences between males and females. So the genetic, physical, and hormonal differences between women and men. Now, what I think is interesting is that a lot of uh, biologists and neuroscientists are beginning to demonstrate to us that there's not just two genders. There's not just men and women. And in fact, there's this one uh, a biologist, her name is Sterling Faust, and she argues that there's at least five genetically different kinds of genders. And so that's something to think about, that maybe we have kind of a uh, a predisposition just to think in the uh, the two, male and female, but that there might be possibilities of more. So gender is a socio social and cultural significance that we attach to these presumed biological differences. So the meanings that we attach to what it is to be a woman or what it is to be a man and how to appropriately show a womanhood or, or manhood. And in fact, a lot of what sociology is about is to look at how women and men are expressing themselves as gendered beings. And so there's this really important set of scholars that they were working back in the 1980s and they've been developing their ideas since then, uh, that they were talking about uh, how we display gender. And so West and Zimmerman, they argue that we feel accountable for fulfilling appropriate gender scripts or displays, that we have like a gender script in our mind about how things should go. So for example, uh, if you're going to go to prom, you kind of have a gender script about uh, whether you're, if you're a woman, whether you'll be wearing makeup and what kind of earrings and do, are you going to get a dress and uh, where is he going to be taking you and will he be bringing you a flower or a corsage? Uh, you have kind of a mental model of what you're expecting. And so they wanted to study this about how, uh, as we're, we're engaging as men and women in the world, how we're receiving positive and yet negative feedback from people based on our gender performance. So if I came uh, into class and I was entirely dressed, uh, you know, just in a, a, a male clothing, uh, including having a cane, a walking cane, and uh, I was wearing a false mustache, would you give me a weird look? Uh, and would I take that as feedback that you think that my gender display is inappropriate? And so that what we're doing is we're reading each other, we're reading our cues, and we're engaged in a performance together. And so we're trying to perform gender for each other. And then we feel accountable for doing so. And so, for example, when men and women marry, uh, they feel accountable for fulfilling what they think is appropriate wifely or husbandly duties. And the sociologists are kind of studying that, like what are the changing gender displays that we have over time? Do younger people feel differently about gender displays than older people? So I think that's a big area of my research that I think is interesting. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about uh, kind of like the sweep of feminist movements over the course of oh, a little over 100 years or so in the United States of America. And so if I'm doing that, you can be sure that I'm giving you really an unbelievably uh, kind of short, uh, short shrift. And that probably if you take uh, multicultural studies or ethnic studies or gender studies classes, you'll learn even more. Um, but I'm going to be presenting to you kind of like this broad brush strokes. Uh, uh, to do that, I'm going to talk to you about three different waves of feminism. And even that is a problem uh, because uh, these waves, it, make it, seem, it makes it seem as though uh, a feminist movement has three separate waves. They're really coherent. Uh, they're really homogenous. Everybody agreed about what they were about. And that's not the case at all. That actually 
uh, feminist movements at any given time were filled up with a diversities of people with different perspectives about what they were trying to accomplish. And so you should take it with a grain of salt when I talk to you about waves. Okay, but anyway, ha having said that, the first wave of a uh, feminist movement uh, are women's uh, efforts to kind of articulate for themselves social, economic, and political equality for women. And so this especially was about trying to get women the right to vote uh, in national elections, trying to get women enfranchised, to get suffrage. And so uh, the first kind of feminist movement around this started in upstate New York in the town of Seneca Falls. You probably already know that. Uh, around 1848, uh, they had a, a meeting uh, of, of people who were interested in, in, in campaigning for that. And uh, in fact, uh, 1872, Susan B. Anthony was arrested for attempting to vote. Uh, we didn't, women did not have the right to vote then, and she tried to vote in a national election and was arrested for it. And in fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, during the 2016 election, uh, when Hillary Clinton ran, uh, when women uh, and men were voting, uh, you know, we get those little stickers that says, I voted, uh, that uh, people went to Susan B. Anthony's grave and kept on putting the stickers on her grave to kind of talk about how happy they were not only to be able to vote, but to be able to vote for a woman candidate. So that's kind of interesting to think about that. But basically, women didn't get the right to vote in national elections until 1920. So in 1919, uh, the First Amendment uh, you know, was, it was drafted and it wasn't ratified until 1920. And so the 19th Amendment grants women the right to vote in national elections. And so that means it's 2020. So this summer is supposed to be the anniversary of women's uh, enfranchisement, women's uh, ability to vote, 100 years of women's voting. Uh, and so I hope that they were planning all sorts of festivities uh, in Washington, D.C. I hope they're going to be able to have those, uh, that the coronavirus doesn't interfere. So that gives you kind of like, uh, what's interesting to know about this is that uh, it wasn't necessarily an, an even thing. And so, for example, uh, white upper class women were really especially arguing that they had the, should have the right to vote, but they didn't necessarily want black women to have the right to vote. Uh, and black people were kind of fighting for the right to vote, and in particular for black men's right to vote, especially since uh, during this time period, there's also Jim Crow laws that were kind of disenfranchising black men from voting. And so it was a time period where you could see it wasn't necessarily the cleanest social movement overall, that there was racism and sexism as part of it. And in fact, if you read Frederick Douglass, uh, somebody who we can think of as a really important historical figure around these things, uh, he, he was a, a man who escaped from slavery and was really active in uh, enfranchisement movements. He argued that all people who are uh, free people, adults, should be able to vote, women and men. Okay, so that's uh, interesting. You may, many of you may already know who Susan B. Anthony was, but do you know who this is? So this person, this person is Victoria Woodhull. And so she is a woman who, uh, during the, like the mid-19th century, uh, she became really rich by being a spiritualist. So she helped people commune with uh, the afterlife, with people in the afterlife. And then when she got done doing that, she was the first woman, along with her sister, Tennessee Claflin, uh, to own the first woman-owned um, brokerage uh, on, on Wall Street. And so she became really rich doing that. Uh, and then she purchased a newspaper and became really rich running her newspaper. And so she ran for president. And she ran for president in 1872. So that's kind of how far ahead of the curve she was. She didn't even have the right to vote in an election, let alone run for president. And she wasn't even old enough. So the Constitution says that president has to be 20, 35 years old. And she was 34 years old when she ran. So uh, I just think that's sort of interesting uh, about this woman uh, running, gosh, 45 years before women had the right to vote. The second wave uh, emerged in the 1960s. Uh, and it came into full force in the 1970s. And so in the 1960s, there was this woman, she's a, a white middle-class woman uh, named Betty Friedan. She just died recently. She wrote this book called The Feminine Mystique. And in it, she was kind of writing about what she called the problem that has no name. And what she meant by that is uh, that women, they had to kind of be subservient and be secondary to men and that they were supposed to be good homemakers and keep quiet. And, uh, and men got to be active in the world and go out in the world uh, and, and have a full and uh, active political and social life, and that women were just supposed to be helpmeets, and that she didn't like that. And so she left her husband, and she became a graduate student. Uh, and her book is, 
She kind of wrote it while she was a graduate student. She kind of would sit out on her patio and she would smoke cigarettes and drink wine and think through this problem that has no name. She was trying to develop consciousness raising groups for women. Uh, and so the, in the 1960s and 1970s, what you saw is that women really became focused on women's reproductive rights and control over their bodies. So 1963, for example, is when women uh, or when uh, uh, scientists developed the birth control pill. And so it became kind of explosively part of the scene about whether women control could control their sexuality and control their fertility. The women's movement this time was incredibly diverse. You had a, a variety of different people from different social classes and racial and ethnic groups, uh, and that the women's movement often tied into the anti-war movement and to uh, the civil rights movement. So it was kind of a very fertile moment. And also the youth movements. This is also the time of the hippie movements. Okay, and so then the third wave uh, started in the 1990s, and instead of focusing on necessarily women's economic and political power or women's reproductive rights, feminism beginning, began to start kind of thinking through how to embrace the multiplicity of voices, expressions, and experiences, acknowledging that there are women in all places in the world, that there are men who are allies of women, there are people who are transgender, uh, there are people who are different racial and ethnic groups, uh, that there are straight people and queer people. And so the 1990s movement was really about celebrating difference and that celebrating the fact that we not only have a multiplicity of ident identities, that we have a lot of intersectional identities. And so this feminist movement became really focused on social justice issues from a global perspective. Uh, and then also began to acknowledge that maybe when we're thinking about what people are struggling for in their lives, we should think about the many positions they occupy, not just necessarily maybe gender. So that leaves now, like your generation. Some people argue that uh, this third wave uh, still is uh, ongoing and that uh, current feminist debates are kind of connecting with Black Lives Matter movements and other sorts of social movements. And other people argue that feminism has kind of gone to the wayside, that we are a post-feminist society, that women already have uh, all of the resources and uh, uh, equality that they have fought for or need. And so I would just put it up to you to decide for yourself. If you had to say what kind of wave of feminism we are or are not in, what you think that might be. And that's all I have for this lecture. On the next lecture, I want to talk to you about uh, sexual orientation and sexuality and a variety of other things.